Hello YouTube, after building my Voron, I just wanted to print everything. Who doesn't? However, it's a good idea to print spare parts in case something breaks. If you chose PIF functional parts, it does not include the skirt pieces, panel clips, or exhaust. My goal is to eventually print ABS for spare parts inside the chamber. Until then, I will tune for PET-G, which I print most often, and that material can be used for parts outside the chamber. My very first print, the calibration cube, was acceptable. However, the benchy was completely jacked up, which was odd because other things printed perfectly fine. I run Super Slicer on multiple computers, and it turned out the part cooling fan got disabled on one profile. This happens quite easily, so find a way to back up or save a known good configuration. Speaking of cooling, my first mod was the Raspberry Pi heatsinks from Amazon. Other boards such as the Orange Pi include these, and they really should be part of the bomb since they are cheap. Without cooling fans in the electronics bay, this Pi gets to over 60 degrees Celsius. I can't imagine how hot it would get without the heat sinks. Recently, the umbilical cable snagged on the power cord and ripped the can low wire. While repairing, I opted for thicker gauge signal wires and added a Molex connector. This simplifies future maintenance and troubleshooting. At the tool head, I added a microfit connector to the inductive probe power wire. The spade connectors were impossible to disconnect without ripping the wire. Until now, I used the web GUI to control the printer. A touch screen is nice for live Z adjustment or emergency kill. I have an old Nexus 7 from 2012 and run clipper screen on it. The setup wasn't quite straightforward due to age of the device. I will link my notes in the description. Clipper screen has been useful as my Pi seems to drop Wi-Fi at high temps. That locks me out of both SSH and the web GUI. Basic tuning. I recommend using the Super Slicer calibration prints. I went through all of them starting from top down. I won't go in detail since I'm not familiar enough with these topics to provide good information. Just read and follow the detailed directions for each test. I only made two changes lowering the extruder temperature to 230 degrees Celsius and increasing the retraction length from 0.75 to 2.4. This was mainly to help reduce shrinking, which is typical with PET-G. Afterwards, I printed a second calibration cube, which looks slightly better than the first one. The bottom layer looks a little too squished and there's still some shrinking. The second bench sheet also looks better, but the front edge still has some imperfections. With just a few calibration prints, the improvements were visually obvious. I noticed my Z motors were really loud, mostly when moving up. I changed the stealth chop threshold from 0 to 99999. This significantly reduced the noise and it's a good starting point. From what I read, you should not change the setting on the A and B motors. This is very easy and if it doesn't help, simply revert the change. To clean up the growing config file, I moved the macros into a separate file and named it accordingly. Back in the main config, add a reference to the macro file and that's it. No more visual clutter. All my high-end LEDs were different colors. I added this line to config, which makes all LEDs the same color. Note that it is GRBW, even though the NeoPixels are specced RGBW. Otherwise, the color wheel and clipper will have the red and green colors inverted. If you want to control the logo and nozzle LED separately, go to main sale, interface settings, miscellaneous, and add groups for the hot end RGB entry. This is the easiest way to do it unless you want to mess with macros. Those allow for custom colors during specific print sequences. I'm going to skip all that. After basic calibration, move on to the next set of tunes, which are a bit more involved. First is input shaping, which had an immediate showstopper. It would reach 50 to 80 hertz before a clipper shut down and threw a timer to close error. The log showed another error, resetting prediction variance, which is considered more critical. There's not much information about these online, as they could be caused by multiple issues. Worse, while this was happening, my Z2 axis seized. It made loud clicking sounds before jamming during a quad gantry level. Turns out the drive belt got loose, likely from vibration during input shaping tests. Thankfully, I caught this early, otherwise the A-drive plastic may have cracked while seized. This is a good reason to prioritize printing spare parts once everything is tuned. Back to input shaping, I found suggestions that people tried to get it running successfully. First, for some basic tests, 
accelerometer query, and measure accesses noise. These check for connection, wiring, and hardware problems. The remaining changes were done in order while attempting to rerun input shaping in between them. First is the CAN0 network config file. I increased the queue length from 128 to 2048. Next, I reduced the micro steps of the X and Y motors from 32 to 16. Finally, I added this a cell per hertz 50 line under the resonance tester entry in config. As I made changes, the resetting prediction variance errors disappeared. Each attempt, the test got closer and closer to 133 hertz before shutting down Clipper. This is often symptoms of a data bottleneck, commonly due to CAN bus speeds being too low. Since the timer errors persisted, I reflashed CAN bus to use the higher 1 million speed. This means starting over by reflashing CAN boot to both Octopus and EBB36 boards. There are no shortcuts, I tried. The make menu config for Octopus CAN boot does not specify a CAN bus speed. However, if you don't wipe and reflash, the Pi won't recognize it as a USB device. I'm sure there's a workaround, but I found it quicker to just redo everything. Unlike the first time which took an entire day, I completed this in 30 minutes. If you need help, check out this video from my build series. With the CAN bus speed upgrade, input shaping for both X and Y completed without issue. At this point, I started reverting the config changes. I prefer the A and B motors to use higher microsteps for reduced noise. Unfortunately, removing the SL per hertz line caused input shaming to fail again, with the same timer error. I left that change alone, along with the network config modification from earlier. Following the documentation, these are the graphs for X and Y. I simply set my input shaper to the peak on both. These numbers are pasted under a new entry called input shaper in config. I am using MZV. Next tune is max acceleration, which uses the settings from input shaper. The calibration print starts at the bottom with 1500 speed. It increases 500 each step as it prints up. It's hard to see, but it completed around six steps before gap started showing. This is around 4,500 speed, but can be reduced to 4,000 as a safety margin. There are no gaps on the other side. Modify this number in config and restart. Final tune for today is pressure advance, which involves printing a hollow cube. Most of these require certain slicer settings and terminal commands, which I'll also link below. It's hard to see, but too little pressure advance is on the right side, while too much is on the left. Find and measure the sweet spot in between with calipers. My number happens to be 21.25, so multiply that by 0 0.005 for direct drive. That provides the pressure advance number of 0 0.10625. Update your own unique number in the config. The third queue printed really well. What a difference. Again, it's hard to see on camera, but the layer lines are much less noticeable after tuning. The bottom corners look much cleaner and I am very happy with this print. As for the third benchy, the bow is perfect compared to the first and second attempts. There are still some imperfections on the left side. Finally, general housekeeping and best practices. If you are like me, you don't store filament and leave the spool mounted. These sterilite containers come with crappy seals. It has gaps in multiple places, and the first lid delivered to me was missing the blue seal entirely. After adding silica gel, the inside moisture dropped significantly, and after a week, it was down to 28%. 24 hours of print time goes by quick, and it's time to retighten any loose screws and belts. I would not mess with set screws unless they are loose. Flip the printer. Check the wiring again for any burn marks that may indicate a slow but dangerous problem. Since I adjusted belt tension, I reran input shaping. If you are wondering about electrical costs, this Kaza smart plug is useful and often goes on sale. I pay 15 cents a kilowatt hour, so it's pretty reasonable. At idle, it only needs 6 watts with the motors off. The most power draw is during bed heat up before fluctuating during prints. You saw the UPS, it's nice to have around. The power in my house flickers quite often even before I built the printer. For anyone debating between the Meanwell power supplies, the 200 watt is completely silent. Here is the fan noise of the 350 watt on another printer at idle. It is a noticeable difference if noise concerns you. It all adds up. 
Case in point, here is the AI Trip 5015 fan that I said sucks in a previous video. Here's the noise it makes at 20% speed. And that's it for today. If you learned something new, please like and subscribe, and I will see you all next time.